Imagine it's 1926 and you're a young woman of 21. You dance, you laugh. You're a star in a star bright decade. Then suddenly one day you begin to have trouble moving until finally you hang suspended, alive but dimly aware, imprisoned in a frozen body. This was once a young 20s flapper named Rose. Millions of people would die from the epidemic called sleepy sickness, which causes a series of lesions in the brain. Those who lived would spend 40 years in this purgatory, forgotten by life and time. For some, it was a kind of dream world, but others were condemned to tormenting repetitions, like the endless contemplation of two equals two equals two. One patient described how she had to walk around a mental square to seven notes from a Verdi theme. And this would go on for hours and days, wouldn't but that's stop. that's hell. Mm. This, I think, is what one intuits, that uh, there may indeed be something like a sort of hell. Though he looks like a stray Santa Claus, Oliver Sacks is in fact a voyager in hell. He is a doctor who also writes about the dark continents of human illness. But he writes with such passion and joy, he has drawn millions of people into worlds they might have shunned. Like the world where the victims of sleepy sickness were still floating in emptiness back in the late 1960s. Sachs was a young neurologist at Beth Abraham Hospital in New York. He decided to gather the 80 known patients together, bring them in from the institutions where they had been stored like human furniture. He had heard about an experimental drug called L-DOPA, now used widely on Parkinson's patients. He wondered if L-DOPA might be the miracle which could jolt their brains back into life. So I hesitated, and I hesitated for two years. They'd been put away for, for 40 years, and I didn't know what coming back to the world and coming back to a world which was not their own might mean to them. And then finally my hand was forced because so many of the patients were terribly disabled. Some of them couldn't feed themselves. Some of them were dying. It was 1969, and Sachs was right about L-DOPA. It was like seeing the dead arise. Up they came, up, out of the chairs that had been their prisons. The first feeling was that it was just wonderful to be alive after being dead so long. Esther, so frail she couldn't turn over in bed, walked for the first time in 40 years. Leonard, who had spent the decades reading, his mind was alive, his body wouldn't move, now could walk to a blackboard full of things to write and say. And Rose, who went to sleep as a coquette, can be heard off camera singing a bawdy song. If you don't tickle me in the right place, I'll take off my pet. And then the flapper dances again. When she came to 1969, she kept talking about 1926 and talking about Gershwin and others who were current then. She said, I know it's 1969, I feel it's 26. I know I'm 64, I feel I'm 21. She said, I've been a spectator for the last 43 years. Their skin was eerily young, faces that have no expression acquire no wrinkles and they were so greedy for experience, they bravely wrestled with the side effects of the drug. Yet for most, at the beginning, the jerks, the stops, were a small price to pay for life. Lola Hester, who is having all sorts of side effects, <laughs> and, and one arm is like this, all sorts of ticking movements, and she looks absolutely tormented by movements, and yet she has, she suddenly smiles, and in that sort of gay, defiant smile, she's saying, you know, I'm, I'm alive and damn you all, and I'm, I'm still enjoying life. These days, a county hospital in Brooklyn is serving as a movie set for a film about those famous patients and the famous doctor. Penny Marshall is directing Robert De Niro and Robin Williams, who plays a rumpled, slightly eccentric, very familiar physician. 
know, I'm not conscious of oh, you know, the way I stand or move or, or mannerisms, and then um, then you see uh, some, uh, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <yeah. laughs> you should see him with the patients. It's amazing. They love him. I mean, it is, he has a. And they want to take care of him. Yeah, they <laughs> want to take care of him. They go. They, you go visit when you go on hospital rounds with him. He's basically. They're going. Hey, hey, hey! What? You, don't do that! Don't do that! Don't do that! And they want to make sure that he's all right. That he's, you know, fix your tie. What do you think his gift is? It's weird because you know, from talking to him, he can be. Um, oh, good. Oh, well. Oh, um. <laughs> Very good. And, but then he's like a laser sometimes because he can get inside him and really become so precise on things that it's frightening. I mean, that he can just, he zeroes in on something and becomes so focused and then finds out the deepest part of it. At that point, you then show the slide, which shows the anatomical basis. Right. Sachs pours over the script of the film. His patients asked him to write the book about them. He's still the loving guardian of their lives and their individual strange ballets. What do you find observing it, that each of these ticks, each of these strange choreographies is more complicated than it seems? Oh, yeah. They're all connected in some ways, too. That, Like he said, they build rhythmically. This tick will then connect to this tick, and then this will react off of that, and then they're all... The actors say they've had to learn the lesson Sachs teaches over and over again. If this is a story about struggle, it's also a story about joy. The power of the human spirit is so amazing. You see Lillian, she's like a beacon. In the documentary, Lillian Ty wrestles with one of the side effects of L-Dopa, an uncontrollable shaking of her head. What's it like doing your hair when your head's shaking like that? Kind of follow it around. Devil putting a part in, though. She is one of only three of the original 80 patients still alive. When the medicine wears off, she sits frozen like a stone. But four times a day, she gets L-Dopa, which she relishes like a cocktail in the desert. She had just taken it before we walked in the door. Uh, Lillian, Hello. this is Diane Sawyer, Lillian Tai. I'm Diane. It's so good to meet you. With the first medication, what was the first new sensation you felt? You could move. <laughs> it was a miracle, yes? Yeah. In an inexplicable quirk of the brain, L-Dopa causes Lillian to speak in repetitions like a slightly scratched record. Yet when she reads, it stops. And it stops when she sings. It will be stylish now I can't afford a carry. And I'll be damned if I'll be can I write the real for two. <laughs> and even when she's repeating herself or hurled around by the medication, she recruits you to laugh with her at her quirky, determinedly happy life. Can you say it's a quarter to twelve? I'm going to have lunch soon. <laughs> now why did you have any repetition with it? No, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things which is fascinating about various sorts of neurological disorders is that if the patient will find some way of going on and of preserving or recreating an identity uh, around the deficit, he will adapt in some very profound sort of way. Which brings us back to the time of the awakenings. I didn't realize there would be this, this sort of resurrection in the summer of 69 and I certainly didn't anticipate how grim things might become afterwards. Within a matter of days, it was clear. In some patients, the drug not only triggered strange gestures, but grotesque appetites for sex, for food. And sometimes after eating, to sort of stuff, stuff their fingers on napkins into their mouth, and they felt they were losing control then, and uh, losing dignity. Some of the patients decided it was better to have dignity in purgatory than life without any pride. Leonard asked to be taken off the medication. Within hours, he returned to his frozen state, bright eyes inside a concrete body. And in the end, Rose, the reawakened flapper, couldn't accept the 64-year-old body trying to dance to those girlhood memories. She said she didn't like our television age, as she called it, 
And after 10 days of this sort of strange 1926-ish animation, she rather suddenly went back to this trance-like state. And nothing we could do after that sort of had any effect on her. Did they seem failures to you? They seemed re realists in, in a way. I mean, there's great dignity, great stoicism in this uh, position without, without hope or without regret. Back at the movie set, they are filming a scene in which the explorer is about to release a patient, one of those who made it and will now set sail on his own into a brand new world. Was that the sweetest time? Yes, it, it was um, mostly in the hospital. People don't leave except, um, except horizontal. And that was wonderful to see him go back into life. What is the message? The patients and awakening send the rest of us. I think finally it's a message of, of survival, that one can go through hell and one can be in hell and yet, uh, and yet survive and, and even transcendently as tough and funny and loving life, even if there is no hope in the ordinary sense. Say I love you. If you think you care a lot